Um, we do recognize there are broader tensions in the region as a result of that, uh, which is why we have deployed additional capabilities into the Eastern Mediterranean uh, and into the U.S. Central Command area of responsibility to provide us with uh, the options necessary to respond to a wide variety of contingencies. So those forces are really there for two things. One, to deter uh, any escalation of a broader regional conflict, which no one wants to see. Uh, and then two, to ensure that we have the forces and capabilities in the theater to protect our forces that are there doing other important national security work like the defeat ISIS mission, like keeping the lanes of shipping open and working with regional partners to, to, uh, on air defense and things like that. So again, right now, uh, we are working very hard to prevent this from becoming a broader regional conflict. We're working very hard to make sure that our forces can continue to stay focused on their mission, while at the same time supporting Israel and their fight to defend themselves from terrorism. This is my video update from Sofia, Bulgaria on this Tuesday afternoon, October the 31st. Let's talk about some news and let's start things off with a very quick update on the war in Israel and into Gaza. And I say into Gaza because we are getting reports that uh, some sort of ground operation is taking place and it looks like the Israeli defense forces are working on some sort of encirclement of the north of Gaza. This is what The Guardian is reporting. Israeli forces appear to be advancing on Gaza City from two sides. Witnesses report Salah al-Bin Road cut as Israel expands assault in apparent effort to divide strip in two. Israel, Israeli tanks and infantry have advanced on Gaza City from two directions with tanks reported to be on the main north and south road in an apparent effort to cut the strip into two. So an encirclement, a cauldron, that's what this sounds like, of the, of the north of Gaza. So Netanyahu, he said in a statement that that phase one of uh, this operation had been completed. Phase two, he said, was in the process of being completed or is about, is about to be completed. And uh, phase three is getting underway. I guess phase three is this encirclement of the north of, of Gaza. Uh, Netanyahu also said yesterday in a statement that a ceasefire is out of the question. He said a ceasefire cannot and will not happen. Uh, for Netanyahu, a ceasefire, in my opinion, if he were to, to call a ceasefire for whatever reasons, say because of international pressure or pressure from the UN or whatever, if he was going to call a ceasefire, then, then he would be most likely he would be removed from, uh, from office and uh, from a domestic, from a domestic standpoint. That would mean that Netanyahu would have all kinds of uh, problems because he is facing various uh, legal issues in, uh, in Israel. So um, ceasefire, not going to happen. And uh, the fact that you have all of the, the, uh, the U.S. military resources, the entirety, it seems like you have the entirety of, uh, of the U.S. military. I'm exaggerating it. But uh, you have so many uh, U.S. military assets in Israel, uh, in the Mediterranean, um, backing up, or at least that's what the U.S. is telling us. They're backing up Israel. They're acting as a deterrent force. The fact that you have so much U.S. military hardware in the Med Mediterranean also doesn't make it easy to, to get to a ceasefire either. So it looks like uh, escalation is, is where we're, we're heading towards. Uh, what kind of escalation? Hard to, hard to know, hard to tell. Uh, we don't have the type of transparency um, on the ground militarily that we have in, in the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, the conflict in Ukraine, you, you got a very good feel for, for how things were progressing. I mean, you understood uh, the tanks that were being uh, destroyed. You understood the progress that was being made. You understood... Uh, the artillery rounds that were being used. I mean, we got, we have a very clear picture of what is taking place in uh, in Ukraine. In the case of of this war, not so much, not so much. It's very hard 
to get an understanding as to the progress or the lack of progress that is being made, uh, the resistance that Hamas is, uh, is putting up, we, we just don't know. Uh, there are reports, there are reports which paint very different pictures uh, from, from all sides, but I just don't feel confident enough to, to say this is what's happening or that's what's happening because there's, there's just this media blackout and there's a lot of fog of war still. So, so let's give it some time and I guess we'll see how this, uh, this operation plays out and, and how big, how big of an operation we're, we're talking about here. So that is the article from uh, The Guardian, an encirclement of North Gaza. Narod, Narodin Teater Ivan Vasov. Beautiful building, huh? Beautiful building. Okay, let's uh, let's shift gears here, and let's talk about the EU and Russian assets. The European Union, they have greenlit the the seizure, the usage, the usage of profits from frozen Russian assets. That's what I want to say. Uh, Politico, they have an article with the title: "EU leaders approve using profits." from frozen Russian assets, more than 200 billion in Russian assets are sitting in the European Union. So, uh, so there we are. The European Union, it looks like they are finally pulling the trigger on taking the, the Russian frozen assets. Seize, not freeze. <laughs> Isn't that what Van der Crazy said a year ago? when this whole asset story was uh, being talked about. Seize, not freeze. Russia's economy is in tatters, tatters, I tell you. And so this is a really bad move for the European Union. Uh, this is not taking, they're not at the stage yet where they're just going to steal the 200 billion. We're talking about uh, interest on the 200 billion that uh, they have frozen and using this interest uh, tax actually taxing the interest and then using those proceeds to uh, to give to the Oletsky regime or pretending that you're giving it to the Oletsky regime. I mean, this is just outright theft. And when and when I'm I mean taxing the the interest, I think what the EU is talking about is that they're just going to take the interest that this 200 billion is generating and just consider that to be a tax and just pocketing that money, oh, give, giving that money to the Oletsky regime. Excuse me. Anyway, uh, not a good idea. This is going to really damage the, uh, the European Union, uh, the, the financial reputation of the European Union. This is going to damage it in a big, big way. This is what Politico says. Of around 300 billion of Russian frozen reserves, frozen by countries participating in sanctions at the onset of Moscow's war in Ukraine, the majority, more than 200 billion, sit in the EU. As Russian securities reach maturity and are reinvested by financial intermediaries, they generate a profit. The EU has floated the idea of taxing those profits for Ukraine's benefit. But the European Central Bank and some EU capitals, including Paris and Berlin, have expressed doubts. They are afraid the move would royal financial markets and weaken the euro's standing as a reserve currency. Yep, it's exactly what it will do. But is the, European go is the European Union going to listen? No, 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 no. They are not going to listen. They know that Project Ukraine is crumbling and crumbling very quickly. And uh, they want to get their hands on this money. It's that simple. They want to get their hands on this money. And so the first step to get, the hands on, to get their hands on the full $200 billion is to uh, get at the interest and the profits. Once they can create the legal justification to, to, uh, to seize the, the profits, the interest in the profits, well, that opens up the path to taking the full 200 billion. And of course, it's all about giving the money to, to Ukraine, to the Alensky regime, which just basically means that the money is going to go to, to the globalists and the elite EU kleptocrats 
So they want to get the money before Project Ukraine falls apart. That's why they are, uh, they are ignoring the advice of financial experts and they are opening the way to, to start seizing the 200 billion in Russian frozen assets. Very, very bad move from the European Union, but they just can't help themselves. No reverse gear and flat out greed. That's what we're talking about. So Time Magazine, they put out an article on uh, Ukraine and specifically on Alensky. And the title of their article is Nobody Believes in Our Victory Like I Do. Nobody. And that is a quote from Alensky. And you are seeing the cover of this Time Magazine article right now on your screen. And it's, uh, it's red, a red cover with uh, a little... A little tiny Alensky, a little tiny green Alensky on the bottom of, uh, of the article, his back facing, facing us. Nobody believes in our victory like I do. Nobody. Words, famous last words from Alensky. And this article, boy, this article, it really, really does a number on, uh, on Alensky. The article basically says that Project Ukraine is a disaster and Alensky is delusional. <laughs> That's pretty much what this article is saying. And it's a long article. It's a long article, but they've, uh, they've double D'd Alensky. Disaster and delusional. <laughs> that, is, that is what Time Magazine is is reporting in this article. And basically the journalists that wrote this article, they, uh, they were with Alensky in, uh, in DC, in the United States, uh, about his second trip to the United States, they were with him and then they traveled back with Alensky and his entire staff back to Kiev. And they, they followed Alensky around for, for a good amount of time. And they interviewed Alensky, they interviewed members of his staff, they interviewed military officials and uh, the, the verdict is not looking good for Alensky. It's not looking good for Alensky at all. Basically, his trip in the United States was uh, a disaster, his second trip. Uh, his first trip, they say he was treated like a hero. His, his second trip, he was treated like a zero. He didn't get to speak in front of Congress. He asked to, uh, to go on Fox News, didn't get it. He actually contacted Oprah Winfrey and even Oprah Winfrey turned him down for an interview. You know, it's bad when Oprah doesn't want to talk to you. You know, it's really bad. And uh, the journalists, they asked uh, Alensky's staff how the president was feeling after this disaster trip to the United States. And the word that they came up with is angry. Angry is the word that they came up with. And uh, the article says that Ukraine, the situation in Ukraine, is only getting harder. Alensky told Time magazine, exhaustion with the war rose along like a wave. You see it in the United States, in Europe, and we see that as soon as they start to get a little tired, it becomes like a show to them. I can't watch this rerun for the 10th time. Alensky always likes to use show business uh, analogies when he's speaking, right? He always likes to frame things in terms of, of cinema, the movies, show business. And so he's saying that this is just a bad rerun, a bad rerun that he cannot watch. The problem is that Alensky, he's, uh, he's been handling his, uh, his relations with, with Russia. He's been handling... Um, entering NATO, the special military operation, the conflict, the European Union, the United States. He's been handling all of this stuff as if it is uh, a movie. That's the problem. He's been treating it like a movie. The, even the military strategy that has been employed in, uh, in the conflict has a very cinematic um, feel to it. And that's, that's Zelensky. He sees things as a movie. So, you know, he's using the movie analogies and, uh, 
and he's the one that uh, that has built a strategy around some sort of uh, of movie, as if it's some sort of movie or or TV show. A bad rerun is what is what Alensky told Time. Uh, what else did this article say? This article really revealed some interesting things. Despite the recent setbacks on the battlefield, uh, Alensky does not intend to give up fighting or to sue for any kind of peace. On the contrary, his belief in Ukraine's ultimate victory over Russia has hardened into a form that worries some of his, some of his advisors. It is immovable, verging on the messianic. He deludes himself, one of his closest aides tells me in frustration, we're out of options, we're not winning, but try telling him that. The article also says that it is taboo to even talk about negotiating a peace deal with the Russians. So it's interesting that uh, these, uh, these officials, these staffers, Alensky staffers are telling, are telling Time Magazine that Alensky is delusional, messianic, a God complex is what Alensky has because uh, about two weeks ago, there was a former, a former government official, I believe in the, in the Ministry of the Interior, and uh, this person gave an interview, and uh, they said that Alensky is not only stupid, he's not only unintelligent, they said, but they said that he's delusional. He's got a God complex. And this was two weeks ago. I reported on this when I was in Vienna. I remember reporting on this story. I think it was my clown world, actually, from, uh, from Vienna, like two weeks ago. And so here you have Time Magazine confirming this, this thought that Alensky's administration has of, of the clown puppet leader. He's delusional. He has a messianic uh, complex. So that was, uh, that was an interesting revela revelation from this Time magazine article. They also say that uh, some frontline commanders have begun refusing orders to advance, even when, they can even when they came directly from the office of the president. That's a, that's a direct quote from Alensky staffers. They just want to sit in the trenches and hold the line, but we can't win a war that way. Refusing orders, refusing orders to advance. A direct quote from an Alensky administration staffer, according to Time magazine. At one point in early October, the political leadership in Kiev demanded an operation to retake the city of Horlivka. The answer came back in the form of a question. With what? They don't have the men or the weapons, says the officer. Where are the weapons? Where is the artillery? Where are the new recruits? One of, one of Zelensky's close aides said, even if the U.S. and its allies come through with all the weapons they have pledged, we don't have the men to use them. Ukraine's armed forces have been forced to call up even older personnel, raising the average age of a soldier in Ukraine to around 43 years. They're grown men now, and they aren't that healthy to begin with, says a close aide to Zelensky. Two days ago, Lukashenko gave an interview. And what did Lukashenko say? The president of Belarus. What did he say? Lukashenko called this. Lukashenko said, even if the collective West gives all the weapons and all the money that they have to Ukraine, he said it doesn't solve the problem of Ukraine because Ukraine's problem is that they are running out of men. Lukashenko said this two days ago in an interview. He said they can have all the weapons in Ukraine, but Who's going, to, who's going to use them? They're running out of soldiers. That's what Lukashenko said. And once again, here you have Time Magazine confirming this. It doesn't matter how many weapons and, and all the money. It doesn't matter how much they give to Ukraine at this point in time because they just don't have soldiers anymore. They're even recruiting 43-year-olds 40, is what this article is reporting. They're recruiting 43-year-olds. And we know that they're starting to recruit women. And uh, they're actually now starting to even recruit uh, people with various sicknesses who are asymptomatic carriers of HIV, hepatitis, and tuberculosis. 
they are also now being categorized as fit for service. What a disaster Project Ukraine is uh, turning into. But Alensky, he cannot, uh, he cannot negotiate for peace. Alensky knows that if he negotiates for peace, if he calls a ceasefire, he knows that he's, uh, he's finito. He knows that either the Banderites in the West are going to get him, the Budanovs and these guys, or the neocons, the Newlands and, and the Blinkens are going are gonna to get him. He knows it, so he, uh, he can't. He can't call for a ceasefire. He can't freeze the conflict. He can't uh, sue for peace. If he does that, he's, he's toast, and he understands that. Very similar to Netanyahu, isn't it? Netanyahu can't call a ceasefire because he understands that he's going to lose power. If he calls for a ceasefire, he has the entirety of the U.S. military right there in the Mediterranean. He knows that he has to press forward with uh, this ground operation into Gaza. We'll see if it's successful or not. I don't know. We're, we're in the very, very early stages. But he knows that he has to move forward with escalation. Um, he's, he's boxed in, in a way. And, and Zelensky, he boxed himself in over the last uh, two years in this conflict. He tore up the agreement, the peace agreement that was hammered out in Turkey upon Boris Johnson's uh, consultation and Boris Johnson's trip to Kiev. Alensky was promised all the money and all the weapons and the defeat of Russia. And so he tore up the agreement that would have seen peace in, uh, at the end of March, early April. He ripped it up and he decided that a military solution was the way to go. And that's what Boris Johnson told him. And Alensky believed that. And now he's in, he's in a world of, of a mess. The collective West, they did not consult, they did not advise Alensky properly, did they? Boy, did they lead him down a very, a very uh, dangerous, dark, sinister path. And uh, I wonder if, if they're consulting with, with Netanyahu and Israel is, is going to do the same. Time, time will tell. But be careful with uh, the collective West and their... Uh, and their recommendations and advice and just be careful <laughs> just be careful if you're a world leader if you're a world leader don't fall for it don't fall for all the promises the fortune and the glory and the promises that that they make to you Pashinyan in Armenia there's another world leader that is buying into all of the all of the fortune and the glory and the promises that they're giving him. Anyway, um, Alensky, let's see. Alensky also talked to Time about corruption, the problem that Ukraine has with corruption. And according to Time in this article, he even fired Reznikov to kind of show the collective West that he's dealing with corruption, his minister of defense. So he fired him to kind of... Uh, to kind of uh, dispel the, the, whole, the whole narrative that Ukraine is completely corrupt. So he got rid of Reznikov, but uh, it, didn't solve, it didn't solve anything, according to Time magazine. There was still a whole lot of corruption in Ukraine. Zelensky even told staffers, according to Time magazine, he told staffers, look, don't, uh, don't steal anything, don't take anything, don't rob, don't cheat because we have this, uh, this corruption stigma and uh, it's preventing us from, from getting more money. And uh, the journalist at time, when hearing this, thought, okay, this, this is the way to solve the, the corruption problem, right? The president gives an order for everybody not to steal and so no one's going to steal. And so the Time, uh, the time Magazine journalist, he, he says uh, in his, in his uh, naive thinking, in his naive way, he asked a staffer, so the corruption uh, issue is all solved, right? And uh, the staffer said, no, no. And I quote, people are stealing like there's no tomorrow. So even after firing Reznikov, even after uh, Elensky gave an order to everybody not to cheat and not to steal, this is according to Time Magazine, even after all of this, uh, the, the person that Time interviewed told uh, Time Magazine that 
people are still uh, stealing like there's no tomorrow. That's a direct quote. People are still stealing like there's no tomorrow. And, uh, and what else to wrap up? The summary of this very interesting, very long article from Time magazine. It also said that Alensky was trying to piggy piggyback on the conflict in Israel. He understood that the conflict was going to take up all the attention and all of uh, all the resources and media attention of the collective West. And so he tried to to uh, to piggyback off of the off of the war in Israel. And uh, that failed. That failed miserably. And uh, he he offered a trip to, to Tel Aviv, and a week later, after Alensky offered to, to go to Tel Aviv and provide his, uh, his support to Netanyahu, a week later, the media, not Netanyahu, not the office of Netanyahu, the media put out a report, and uh, they basically said that now is not the time for Alensky to travel to Tel Aviv. So he got his answer from Israeli media reports. He didn't get his answer not to come to Tel Aviv from Netanyahu himself. He got his answer from Israeli media. Ouch. Ouch. And the strategy now, according to this Time Magazine article, is to, uh, the strategy to get more money and more weapons from the Collective West is now all about convincing the leaders of the Collective West that helping Ukraine is in their own national interests. That it will, that it will, as Biden put it, pay dividends. It's a good investment. That's basically a strategy now. A good investment for your country, like Biden is, is trying to do right now in the United States by saying that giving $61 billion to Ukraine is going to create hundreds and thousands of jobs. So it's going to be really good for the United States. That's the strategy now. Let's give $61 million to Alensky because we're going to, cre we're going to create more jobs at home. That is, that is pretty, pretty desperate. It's very desperate. And so uh, yesterday, three U.S. Uh, congressmen actually traveled to Kiev. Uh, congressman Quigley, Congressman French, and another congressman who I forgot, I forgot his name, which shows that we're not talking about very high up U.S. government officials traveling to Kiev yesterday. They sent, well, I think they sent lower level uh, congressmen to, uh, to Kiev yesterday. French from Arkansas, Quigley from Illinois, and Democrat Stephen Lynch from Massachusetts. So they traveled to Kiev yesterday, and the reason they traveled to Kiev was to deliver some bad news to Alensky. Now, of course, the media is saying they traveled to Kiev to tell uh, Alensky that the U.S. government still supports Ukraine as long as it takes, blah, 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 all of these things. What do you need? How can we help, help you? But the real reason for their trip was to tell Alensky, this is the real reason why they went, was to tell Alensky that right now Israel is number one priority. So money, weapons, resources, you're going to have to wait. They're all going to go to Israel first. Here's what, here's what Quigley, according to the official Kiev translation, said to Olensky. And this, this quote says it all. I understand, this is Quigley talking to Olensky, right? I understand that there is a need for 155 millimeter shells, but Israel needs them too. Ouch. Ouch. Forbes is reporting that uh, Ukraine loses, as Ukraine loses more and more of its best Leopard 2 tanks, it's turning back to the old T-72s. This is coming from Forbes. So they were making fun of the T-72s, T remember? When the collective West, when the mainstream media was making fun of those T-72s, those old T-72s that belong in a museum. Remember when they were making fun of those T-72s and how the leopards were badass? The leopards were going to, uh, to defeat Putin's army, crumble the Russian defenses and lead to the downfall of Putin. Remember all of that? Remember all the talk about the Wonder Weapon leopard tanks? Well, 
They're going back to the T-72s. That's Forbes reporting this, not me. And, and let's see, what else here? And the German defense minister, Mr. Pistorius, he, he said in an interview with Germany's ZDF broadcaster on Sunday that Germans must again get used to the thought that the danger of a war in Europe could pose a threat. Discussing Berlin's defense capabilities, the minister called on his compatriots to become war capable. That's a direct quote. Become war capable. And he said that Germany needs to spend more on war. That's going to make the MIC very happy. These words from the German defense minister. Germany needs to spend more on war. I can see the stock stock prices of the MIC companies going up and up and up on comments like this from the German defense minister. Anyway, um, let's see. What should I, what should I talk about next? Should I wrap up this video? How am I doing on time? I'm doing good on time. How about an update on uh, the airport incident in Dagestan? Uh, Putin in a meeting with the Security Council uh, yesterday in Russia he said that uh, what happened in Dagestan was, uh, was Western intel work, confirming what, what we reported on yesterday, that it was Western intel and Kiev intel that, uh, that got these people into the airport, that got the people of Dagestan into the airport. It was the Telegram channel Morning Dagestan, 65,000 subscribers. They got everyone uh, uh, to the airport to to, uh, to protest the, the plane from, from Israel landing in, uh, in this airport. And uh, Telegram, Telegram actually blocked this channel, Morning Dagestan. They blocked it because they said that it incites violence and, violence and, and hatred. So uh, the analysis from yesterday on what happened in Dagestan was indeed correct. This channel was indeed uh, being run by, uh, by Kiev uh, Intel services. And they used this channel, the messaging from this channel, to get people to the airport and to confront the passengers of this, uh, this plane landing from Israel. Uh, Pavel Durev, the founder of Telegram said, and I quote, channels that call for violence, such as this one in the screenshot, will be banned for violating the rules of Telegram, Google, Apple, and the entire civilized world. That is what Durev posted on, on Telegram, I think. That's what he posted on his Telegram channel. So, so there you have it. Putin saying that this was Western Kiev intel behind the incident in Dagestan and Telegram blocking this, uh, this channel. Well, the people that subscribed to this channel, they, they bought into it. They bought into the messaging of, uh, of Morning uh, Dagestan, this Telegram channel. They bought into it. They allowed this Telegram channel to manipulate them and to, uh, to get them to the airport and, and the rest we, we know. So let's do a clown world and we will wrap this video up. And uh, U.S. News and World Report, they, uh, they like to come out with lists. They do like the best universities and the best colleges, best countries to live in. And, and they always like to come up with lists. And, uh, and they came out with the list yesterday. And the list was the strongest militaries. The strongest militaries in the world. And number one on that list from U.S. News and World Report, I have, to, I have to make sure I say U.S. News and World Report because the list is not compiled from Russian media. This is U.S. U.S. media that has put this list together. So we're not talking about uh, Kremlin propaganda or pro-Putin or Russian-friendly media. This is U.S. News and World Report, their list of the strongest militaries has Russia at number one. That's right. Russia, number one, United States, number two, China, number three, and Israel, 
number four. And this is what this is what U.S. News and World Reports says with this list. These countries have the strongest militaries. These are the top countries viewed as having a strong military by global survey respondents. This quality factors into the overall U.S. News best countries rankings and power sub rankings. For more information on the rankings, see our methodology. So. They have rankings for strongest military, economy, geography, population, etc. And so for strongest military, they have Russia at number one. Russia's army now has the world's strongest military. Russia has topped the list of the world's strongest armies, according to the U.S. magazine News and World Report. For the first time in a long time, the United States came in second, China came third, Russia also ranked third in the overall strength index, which takes into account five factors, leadership, economic influence, exports, political influence, and participation in international alliances. So, uh, yeah. How did those sanctions work for you, Ursula and Professor Biden? They worked so well that Russia is number three in the overall rankings and is number one for the military rankings some powerful shovels some very very powerful shovels that russia is using and those microchips from the dishwashers that are powering up the fighter jets and the tanks and the drones so some pretty good microchips <laughs> russia's economy is in tatters tatters i tell you it's in such tatters that they have the strongest military, according to U.S. News and World Report. Russia's economy is in such tatters that they're number three in the overall rankings, according to U.S. News and World Report. And so what is the European Union going to do? Well, they're going to, uh, to take the nuclear option and they're going to steal the frozen assets. <laughs> That's what they're going to do. No reverse gear. No reverse gear. They learn zero lessons. Zero. Oh, boy. The power of the Russian military shovels. The power of the washing machine microchips. Number one, strongest military. So, I mean, you may believe this list. You may not. I'm sure this list is going to, uh, to spark a whole bunch of debate. That's fine, but uh, this is a list that is coming from a U.S. mainstream media publication. So I think that's, that's really important to say that. They're even having to admit that uh, Russia's military is, is strong. And uh, how about Kirby? How about Kirby and Blinken and, and Milley and uh, even Biden himself? How about their, uh, their joke? That, uh, that they really loved this joke. I mean, they really loved telling this one. Uh, they would like to say that uh, they loved saying, uh, Russia's, Russia's military is, used to be the strongest in the world, but now it's the, used to be the second strongest in the world, but now it's the second strongest in Ukraine. I <laughs> remember like Kirby and Milly, they loved to say that to the press. I mean, they loved that line. Kirby would get up in front of the, the media and he would say, yeah, well, you know, Russia's, uh, Russia's military is this, used to be the second strongest in the world. Now it's the second strongest in Ukraine. <laughs> that was Millie. <laughs> that, was, that was Kirby. That was Millie. That was Blinken. I remember Blinken doing an interview. I think it was with like CNN or MSNBC, and he threw out that line. Russia's military used to be the strongest, the second strongest in the world. Now it's the second strongest in Ukraine. Well, U.S. News and World Report is saying that it's the strongest now so in the world. So uh, how about that? Millie, Kirby, Blinken, Bidenopolis, Greece's favorite son. That's the video, everybody, the Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, BitChute, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. There you can see the time. In one hour, I have to get ready for a live stream. We are on Twitter X. Go to the, so let's walk this way. Go to the Duran shop. 
use the code the Duran20 and get 20% off all merch like this hoodie that I am wearing or this this Duran t-shirt that I've got on. All right, take care.